Great. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Company Law. We're going to have a, a very short uh, class, and tomorrow we have like the extended uh, discussion, obviously due to my movement. So without wasting time, uh, at our last meeting, what we saw to do was to do business organization. We introduced the various uh, uh, models or the various uh, vehicles, which a person on the premium may, for example, uh, use in order to uh, turn his uh, capital resources around. So we look at the super protection. We look at the fact that we don't have so many I mean, seriously, you know, legal requirements in terms of uh, what we must uh, go through before we can use the supervisorship. And all that we noted was just like an individual, you have to pay your taxes. And if you want to use a name other than your real name, and in this case, we want to have like a, a registration uh, or, or register the business name, then you have to comply with the requirements for. Uh, registration so that you are able to do that and we so essentially these are the, the things and we look at the the merits and the mer the demerits or the advantages and the disadvantages then we also talk about the incorporated private partnership uh, uh which by law especially the incorporated private partnership act of uh, uh, the team uh act yeah one says to you you are supposed to um uh, you know comply with like partnership it is a strict legal arrangement in the sense that it's not enough for the two or the three or four of you to have raised some agreement that you have partnership and that will actually be giving the legal recognition as a partnership, no, you must comply with the requirements for registration of a partnership under uh, the law. And if you don't do that, then there is no partnership. But that is why in Ghana, we don't just say partnership, we say incorporated, incorporated. That is to say that you have incorporated it. You have registered it under law and the law has given it uh, the status of like a corporation, like a corporate uh, body or entity as it were. Except that in Ghana, uh, in terms of liabilities, we noted that uh, liabilities of the partnership firm could also extend to the partners, especially where the assets of the firm, for example, uh, are not enough to meet various demands or claims you made against it. Now, there are other business uh, organizations or other forms of business organizations or models. The, you have the cooperatives, you have the uh, incorporated uh, or, uh, 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 trusts, and so on. We are not going to discuss this as a class. I made a, the, the rep to give me a group grouping. So what I usually do is that I'm going to assign each of the business model or forms of business organization to a group each uh, so that uh, the group will be directed on what to do. And typically each group, uh, the business organization that will be given, you have to tell us the essential uh, features are there legal requirements for uh, acquiring it, that form, that uh, type of vehicle? Then what are the, you know, the advantages and disadvantages? Are there any legal requirements in bringing it to an end and all that? So if you are giving super proprietorship, you have to tell us you know, these matters. If you are giving incorporated private partnership, you tell us uh, this month. If you are giving 
uh, company limited by guarantee, you tell us. If you are giving the uh, 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 incorporated trust, you tell us, uh, or, or cooperatives, societies, you tell us. So that is how it will be like. And I will push that to the platform so that uh, as you know your group, you know which one you have been given. And you will prepare so that uh, you will do uh, this uh, five minutes presentation on what you have done. Okay, so having said that, we would like to uh, continue. And tonight, I want us to, as I told you, uh, my approach to company law for quite some time is informed by what happens in law practice and also in the courtroom. That is to say that since company law is uh, heavily uh, statute based, if there is a dispute regarding anything company law and you go to court, uh, the court is going to look at this legislation in front of us or the uh, Insolvency and Corporate uh, Restructuring uh, Act, uh, which you know, repealed and replaced the Insolvency Act as the relevant uh, piece of legislation. And for that matter, we need to look at the law itself, and then we uh, analyze and discuss the law together. As we move along, if there are uh, any relevant uh, cases or commentary, we will draw your attention so that you make note of them and also read them alongside. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, having said that, if you take Companies Act 2019 at 992, uh, when we're doing the very introductory topic, we had an idea that uh, if you come to this law, some of the provisions are general. Uh, other provisions are also limited to certain type of companies. So let us uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so uh, as we move on, you will notice that we have uh, essentially the private and public companies, okay? And of course, each of them has also got uh, its own permutations. But so therefore, there are certain aspects of uh, the Companies Act 2019 Act 992, which for example, are applicable to only private companies and not to public companies. In a similar vein, there are some provisions which are applicable to only public companies and not private companies, vice versa. And of course, we also have provisions which are applicable to external companies, companies uh, registered or incorporated outside Ghana. And we also have provisions which are general and for that matter, applicable to all uh, companies. And finally, another thing we should also keep note of is that there are a number of uh, shadows. You know, as you can see, we have about 10 shadows. Uh, 10 shadows. And what a shadow uh, does is that a shadow provide information regarding a particular, uh, let's say, a law. And that information, for example, uh, need not be incorporated in the main uh, uh, provisions. And for that matter, they are. Uh, organized as a, a unit on its own and embodied in a schedule. So we have, for example, first schedule, right? First schedule is about definitions, what they call it, the interpretation or session. Uh, so anytime you're doing anything, you come across any concept, your first uh, point of call is to rush to schedule one, the first schedule, to find out whether the lawmaker has provided any particular definition or explanation. If one is provided, then the way that word or that term uh, is used in Act 992 
must be understood according to the meaning which has been stipulated on it as per the first schedule. So let's keep that in mind. And we have the other schedule doing different things. So we take the second schedule, for example, a uh, constitution for private company limited by shares, a uh, third schedule, constitution for public company limited by shares, fourth, uh, uh, sorry, the fourth schedule, constitution for a uh, uh, company limited by guarantee, fifth schedule, contents of annual returns of a company, a uh, sixth schedule, financial statements, seventh schedule, matters to be uh, expressly uh, stated. Matters to be expressly uh, stated in the report of the auditor. If schedule, procedure for general meetings. Ninth schedule, a form of statement in lieu of prospectus, and financial statement and report to accompany the, the statement. Then the term schedule, content of prospectus on general invitation. Then uh, other thing I would like to draw your attention to is that uh, we have the comparative table. Uh, you no, know, until 2019, when Act 992 was enacted and entered into force, uh, Ghana had operated what they call the a companies act which previously used to be called the company's code and this is the three at 179 for more than 50 years from 1963 up to 2019. now as we remember from the introductory lecture regarding how the companies act for example at 2019 came about that a committee was set up and all that now if you read the memorandum, right? You remember memorandum? Uh, memorandum, uh, if you go to Article 106 of the 1992 Constitution, every bill is supposed to be accompanied by explanatory memorandum. That is explanatory statements telling us the policy rationale, the mischief the law is supposed to address and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at the memorandum accompanying uh, the bill, Companies Bill 2018, which was eventually passed as Companies Act 2019. Uh, those who put the law together make the point that uh, as far as necessary or possible, they have retained uh, a good number of provisions from the repealed at 179. So, like, if we tell like the repeal at 179, they are saying that they've uh, retained many uh, provisions from that. And for that matter, if you know uh, the provision, I think my power let me see, I have to put on my, let me put on my my, my laptop power that was in work. Please just give me.
Yeah, so uh, that's, that's trying to make the point that uh, this table is very important, uh, especially you read, let's say that a few cases out there uh, which apply at 179. So for example, if section eight of at 179 was considered in maybe a particular case, you want to find out section eight of at 179 uh, if has it been retained? If I be retained, what is the uh, equivalent provision in the new law? So you look at the table, you notice that uh, section eight of at one seventy nine is now section what six. So that is how it works. So let's keep that uh, in mind. Okay. So uh, having said that, we will start the substantive uh, discussion uh, itself. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have to know the, the purpose of this law. And the purpose of every legislation is uh, captured in what we call the long title, okay? So uh, legislation has two titles, short title and long title. So this is the where the case is. This is what we call the, the short title, right? Companies Act 2019, that is the short title. Let's keep that in mind. And then we have the long title, this one, where the case I've, I've highlighted it. So that is the, the short of the long titles. So the long title is a statement that you will like purpose of that legislation. So an act to amend and consolidate the law relating to companies to establish the office of the register of companies and provide for related matters. So as soon as we read this, it tells you the purpose, and that is important when it comes to interpretation. Because if there is any uh, you know, lack of clarity or any ambiguity in any provision, and it will have to be interpreted, uh, knowing the purpose for its enactment will also serve a very uh, useful uh, guide or aid to interpretation. So here, uh, it's not the case that we didn't have any uh, company legislation we had. That is why I said there to amend, you know, making changes to uh, at 179. And not only that, to consolidate the law. Consolidate means that uh, at 179 has witnessed piecemeal amendments. So there are a lot of uh, scattered amendments, right? If we can more than 10, uh, amendment to at 179 and it's difficult to uh, keep track. So the lawmakers seek to synthesize, bring the, the separate you know, amendment together in one legislation. That is why we have uh, this. And uh, the third major thing is to establish the office of the registrar of companies. This is a novelty, novelty in the sense that and at 179, uh, it did not really contemplate establishment of a standalone uh, position of a registrar of companies. All that we have is the registrar general, right? The registrar general department. And then the registrar general, for example, does a number of things, including uh, playing the role of a registrar of companies. Now, under Act 992, that is the 2019 legislation, there has been a decoupling uh, so that the, the role of being the, the, man, the administrator, regulator of companies, right, has been taken off the mandate of the Registrar General. And we have a dedicated uh, official, a regulator, known as the registrar of what company. So let us keep that in mind. Good. So now let's go to chapter one, the preliminary provisions. Uh, if we look at uh, session one, it tells us what you call the scope of application. In other words, uh, which companies are amenable to provisions of uh, this particular legislation. And session one one uh, is quite clear. Will somebody read for us? Yes. 
Please read the link. I cannot hear. Session one one. Okay. Except as otherwise provided. This act applies to companies formed in the Republic, whether before or after the commencement of this act. Good. So uh, the provision is quite straightforward. In terms of scope of application, all companies registered in the Republic of Ghana, whether before 2019 or after 2019, when this new legislation came into force, they are to be governed by provisions of Act 992. Of course, uh, that is the general position. That is why it says that except as otherwise provided, there may be few instances in which maybe there'll be a little bit of a discrimination in terms of application. And that will be clear uh, from those provisions. But in absence of anything like that, the general understanding you have is that all companies registered in Ghana, whether so many years ago before Act 992 came into force or after coming into force of Act 992, they are subject to provisions of Act 992. And if, and, and that is why subsection 2 is saying that this new law will not affect validity of anything which was done before the coming into force of this particular Act 992. So let us keep that in mind. We have already looked at the various uh, uh, chapters and how they apply differently. So if you look at session two, you notice that, the, you know, if you take uh, this legislation, let me just tell you one thing. If you take this legislation, okay, uh, it is divided into chapters. So the bigger division are chapters. And then uh, you can have a part, and then you have like the sessions and so on. So chapter two, as according to session two here, chapter two applies to all companies, it's the general provisions. Chapter three applies to only private companies. And I'm sure you are wondering what's a private company, don't worry. Very soon I'm going to discuss the various types of companies as we move on uh, further down there. And then chapter four applies to public companies. And chapter five applies to external and non ghanian companies. So let's keep that in mind. External and non ghanian companies. Of course, uh, the introduction of non ghanian companies is bringing unnecessary complexity because under the old law, all that we usually talk about is the external companies. And by external companies, we know uh, companies which were actually incorporated uh, outside the Republic of Ghana. But we come and take each of them and discuss them at length. Good, now uh, we've met uh, session three already when we're discussing uh, incorporated private partnership. And what session three is essentially trying to do is to say that uh, if you have a situation uh, which is, you know, is more than uh, 20, you have a membership of uh, no, more than uh, 20, then you are required to register it as a company. You are required to register it as a company and uh, you will not be allowed to, uh, for example, uh, Operates as partnership, for example. So let's take the word then. Yes, a reader. Okay, the reader is gone. Good. So if we take the session three, yes, reader. A company or an association consisting of more than 20 persons shall not be formed for the purpose of carrying on a business that has for the object of the company or association the acquisition of gain 
at the company or association by the individual members of the company or association, unless the company or association is registered as a company under this act or is formed in pursuance of any other enactment. Okay, good. So uh, our law forbid, if we like, unregistered, unregistered uh, association or unincorporated association of uh, people uh, for purposes of doing business, making profits. That is what they're saying. And that is why uh, if you look at it, it doesn't mention incorporated private partnership. But if you just oppose this with the definition of incorporated private partnership, you notice that uh, the law is actually uh, alluding to the fact that uh, a private partnership uh, cannot have more than 20 members. And if you look at uh, the private partnership uh, law, you notice that uh, it cannot be more than what, uh, 20. Now, if you look at subsection four, you've met it already, so I'm just going to go very far. When we're discussing the introduction. Uh, subsection four is very important. It's talking about companies formed for special purposes. What do you mean by that? We have banks, we have insurance companies, right? We have the pension uh, funds and so on. Now, these companies are called uh, you know, companies set up for special purpose because they are subject to regulatory uh, supervision. Banks, for example, they have a regulator, right? The Bank of Ghana and others. Insurance, the Ghana National, they have the insurance uh, radical commission and so on. Now, these companies set up for special purpose present a challenge. And challenge is this. Are they amenable to only the things which are in company law, as in the Companies Act at 992, or they are also subject to additional regime. And that is why Session 4 is saying that the fact that at 992 is going to make rules which companies registered under at 992 must follow does not mean that those companies which are set up for special purposes their additional regulation will not apply. It will still apply. So if you're a bank, for example, you're a company first, you have to register under at 992, all the requirements here, you have to follow them. At the same time, because you are a bank, you're also subject to the special regulation, the banks and special deposit uh, taking financial institution uh, legislation, you are subject to that. The Bank of Ghana is a regulator, and if it issues directives, as the Supreme Court acknowledged in the case of the uh, associated uh, uh, finance against the EcoBank and all that, you have to also comply. So session four is reminding us that Act 992 is not suspending or setting aside special regimes or special legal arrangement for companies set up for special purposes like maybe banks, insurance, and so on and so forth. So let's keep that in mind. Good. Then the other point we should keep in mind is session five. It's very important, especially when we are discussing directors and uh, some aspect of corporate finance. Uh, session five is making savings of equity and common law. So, uh, Rida, take five for us. The, the rules of equity and of common law applicable to companies shall continue in force unless they are inconsistent with a provision of this act. Good. Now, uh, before this legislation, company law has evolved, right, for many years. 
and even the pillar principle of company law, which we'll be discussing uh, you know, after talking about registration of company, what they call like the, the, the concept of a legal personality or corporate personality, uh, enunciated by the House of Laws in the case of uh, Solomon and Solomon and all that. Uh, the case of uh, uh, Trevor and Whitworth, which propounded the capital maintenance doctrine and all that. All these are common law uh, you know, principles. Now, section five is saying that the common law principles, the principles laid down in the cases are still considered part of our company law. The only caveat is that where there is a uh, disconnect or you have a divergence between what provisions of our legislation is, is saying and then what the common law in a particular case law is saying, where the two do not agree, then uh, our Companies Act will supersede the common law. But in absence of any contradiction or inconsistency, uh, the common law and equity relating to companies are considered as forming part of our company law. And as we move on, we notice that sometimes some of the cases will serve as illumination. They will serve as lights for us to understand certain provisions in the legislation. So let's keep that in mind, please. Any question before we move on? We need to discuss uh, session six and seven before we close. It's very, and the session seven is very important and you need to understand. Any question before we move on? Okay, so let's move on. Now we come to uh, chapter two, provisions applicable to all companies. So what we are going to learn here applies to all companies. And as I told you, the second division is what we call like the part. So part A, that is formation and incidental uh, matters. We are going to look at how you register or how you acquire a company. So first and foremost, uh, the right to form a company is acknowledged by the lawmaker or Act 992 acknowledges the right to form a company. Uh, so session six will tell us one or more persons may form an incorporated company under this act. That is, everyone can comply with the requirement here. And if you remember, when we were discussing the introduction, I made certain uh, points. I said that we uh, have, you know, if you look at the corporate uh, form, how it came about, uh, you could get the incorporated company in the past by special act of parliament, right? So for example, uh, ECG or STC. STC, there may be like a legislation, right? Which set up, let's say, the state transport corporation and so on. Then we also have a general legislation which provide like a framework which anybody at all who is interested in having an incorporated company could, for example, comply with and acquire the company. And the Companies Act, Act 992, is an example of the general uh, legislation for incorporation because it's not really peculiar to any particular uh, company. It's general. The framework is there. Things which you must do in order to get the company registered. Once you do that, you have the registered company. And that is why Session 6 is saying that one or more person may form an incorporated company under this act. Now, mind you, that is to say that instead of being a sole proprietor, 
you can, you alone, you can still register a company. Although, uh, as you move on, you come to know that, despite the fact that the law allow a single member company, every company requires a minimum of two directors. So if you, you want to set up your own company, you still need another person to join you as a second director so that you're able to satisfy the requirements of the law. So let's keep that in mind. And let's look at the types of companies which uh, may be registered or incorporated uh, under our law. So first, uh, if we look at section seven one, it's quite clear that an incorporated company may be A, company limited by shares. So when we say company limited by shares, uh, it simply means, as explained in section 7.2, that a company, it simply means a company which is, I'm just finishing a class in 10, 15 minutes. Um, Yeah, so a company limited by shares, according to section 7.2, is simply a company which has liability of its members limited to the amount unpaid on the shares respectively held by them. What do you mean by that? That is to say that if you are a member of a company limited by shares, first and foremost, you paid money to get your shares, okay? Now the company is running. If the company becomes indebted, the company acquires liabilities and its creditors, for example, are chasing it and all that. And they get judgment against the company. And let's suppose that the assets of the company are not enough to enable the creditors of the company get their debt satisfied. Now, you as a member having the share, you the shareholder, what you stand to lose is the money that you paid for the shares that have been uh, issued to you. Quite apart from that, nobody, can attach your personal assets or properties just because the assets of the company are not enough to pay the creditors of the company what the company owes uh, those creditors. No. So a company limited by shares is a company where liability of its members are limited to the amount unpaid. Now, what do you mean by the amount unpaid? The amount unpaid here, we are referring to situation where shares are be given. Let's suppose that the shares which are be given to you are supposed to pay 1,000 cities. But the company agrees that you can pay half of the value. So you pay 500 cities. So in the company's records, you are still owing the company 500 Ghana cities for the shares which were given to you. Now let's suppose that uh, the company uh, fall on uh, you know uh, hard times and its creditors are chasing it as I explained. Or money is needed, or liquidator is appointed. The money is needed to satisfy the disability of the company. Now you, as a shareholder, who has not finished paying for the shares that were issued to you, that is the unpaid liability. You be called upon to come and pay the amount which you owe in respect of the shares which were given to you. Now, after paying that, if the, the company still owes, that is, the money is not enough to pay the credits of the company, nobody can call upon you to make any payment because you are a member of a company limited by shares and your liability does not go beyond the value of the shares, both the paid value and the non-paid value. Are we clear on that before we move on? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So uh, let's take another uh, yes, time. Sir. 
if you have a question, you let me know quickly before you'll be ending the class early because you will have to go to work tomorrow. And as I told you, I, I arrived in Accra this evening. That is why we started late. But tomorrow we start uh, at the usual time. Yes. If you have a question on what I've said, let me know so that I explain. Company law is not difficult, but it's a little bit technical. So if you follow it, you should be fine. Hello, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, in relation to uh, section seven, subsection 2A. Okay. Whereby, uh, yeah, whereby um, when a company is winding up or a company is at bankrupt and the, um, their liability is limited to uh, the share of its members. Yeah. And here is a case whereby um, a member has not finished paying yes. full payment of its shares. Yeah. And um, so, in taking that amount, that, does it does does it that, that uh, does it amount to accrued interest, or you just take it at the uh, you take the principal amount? Uh, accrued in, I'm not clear. Uh, you mean accrued interest on the money that the, the the shareholder has not finished paying? Yes, please. So let's say that if I understand, like, let's say that the person is supposed to pay 1,000, the company say they pay 500, then 500 is uh, yes, owed please. on the shares. And let's suppose liquidator yes, is a family town. Would the shareholder be made to also pay interest, which has accrued on the 500, in addition to the 500? Is that the case? Yes. OK. Yes, please. That's a very good question. Oh, good. Uh, the answer is yes and no. No, because uh, shares are issued under agreement, right? And if the okay. agreement said that uh, pay half, as okay. and when the company needs money, the company will make a call on you. The company making a call on you means that the company is making a demand for you to come and pay the unpaid value. Now, where that is the case, not until the company has made a call on you, that is, the company has made the demand, you haven't incurred a debt. Okay, so. Yeah. But let's say that where the agreement said that you should pay uh, by uh, today, a call is made or you don't pay, it takes three months and all that then. The issue of accrued interest will become okay, relevant from the time that the unpaid value became due for payment. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Then we also have another, another type of company. So we've talked about first one, company limited by shares. The second one is a company limited by guarantee. Company ah. yes. Um, uh, assuming a company A has a, a shares in company B, yes. And company A is liquidated, but he has unpaid shares, and then company B is now liquidating. What will happen to it? So the one which has the unpaid uh, value, yeah, it's already is liquidated. Is whether ready to rent? Of course. Uh, the fact that it's insolvent means that already it wasn't a financially healthy, isn't it? So, yes, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it just, it just <laughs> like you giving a, uh, a loan to someone who has been adjudged bankrupt. Because if someone has been adjudged bankrupt, what it means is that. The person is not credit worthy. So why will you run that risk of giving money to such a person? The person will not pay. Uh, yeah, so the same thing will apply to that uh, company asset where. Now, a company limited by guarantee, uh, on the other hand, 
uh, according to section seven, subsection two B, is a company which has the liability of its members limited to the amount that the members may respectively undertake to contribute to the assets of the company in the events of it being wind up. That is to say that uh, for a company limited by guarantee, at the start of the company, when the company is being registered, the members or the subscribers, they will indicate how much money they are prepared to pay. Should it become necessary that the company needs money to, uh, for example, uh, meet its uh, uh, liabilities and so on, or debts. Now, it is just undertaking. It doesn't mean that they're actually paying the money, right? Or maybe to use uh, words that you are familiar with, pledge, right? Just like you go to harvest, you don't have uh, money immediately. Then you pledge to pay X amount of money. You haven't paid it, but it's a pledge that you've made that you pay. So in a criminal letter by guarantee, at the time of registering and incorporating the company, the members will make undertaking, a solemn undertaking where you, you know, it will be stated in the incorporating document that uh, you are in the event of the company uh, being wind up, uh, being you know, folded up or closing down and all that, and there are debts and liability which it has to satisfy. You are indicating how much of such amount, such debt, you be prepared to help the company to pay. Now, where you have done that, should the company actually be wind up? That they should they be closed down, and there are debts. Once you have paid how much you undertook to pay, even if it is not enough to satisfy the various debts of the company. Nobody can ask you to pay more than that. So your liability is limited to the amount of money you undertook to pay to help the company to meet its debts and liabilities. So let's keep that in mind. Then we also have another, okay, somebody has something there. Is there a couple number of people who could be members of limited by uh, guarantee? Uh, yes, we we are, we we take there's we take the uh, provision on the limited by guarantee. But this the job that we are trying to do is just to explain the concepts. The one say common limited by guarantee. What does it mean? But we come and take the details of what you need to do. How many people can form it and all that. We come there very soon. Yeah, so the third uh, type of company we talk about is the unlimited uh, company. Unlimited company. So as the name suggests, unlimited. So if you look at the session seven, subsection two C, an unlimited company is a company which does not have a limit on the liability of its members. So liability of its members is not cap. Now, if you look at uh, professions and all that, if they want to incorporate, instead of me probably doing the partnership, they are made to do unlimited uh, you know, liability. Here, it is risky because where the company incurred debts and liabilities, uh, you, the members, your assets can be attached. However, uh, people you know, will go for unlimited liability company for those purposes where the risk is relatively low or where the risk is insured, right? So if we take professionals, for example, if you go to the developed world, for example, a lot of professionals, accountants, lawyers, doctors, and all that, they have insurance policy, meaning that if they are involved in professional negligence, right, suit, and 
damages are awarded against them. The insurance company will come and pay. The insurance company will come and pay. And that is why they can take the risk of uh, using the unlimited uh, company. Then we also have, if you are doing what they call the uh, structured financing, like securitization, securitization, for example, uh, where you have maybe like a, an income stream, you have like a SPV, special purpose vehicle. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that uh, your school, Presbyterian University, uh, uh, of course, the college now, Pres PU, Pres Presbyterian University has gone, to, they say that, okay, you want to get the ultra modern law faculty uh, infrastructure in Kumasi. So they say they've gone for a loan of about uh, 50 million Ghana cities from uh, three banks, which came together to give that loan. And they said they were going to use the school fees from our students to you know, service the loan. So these three banks, which came together to provide uh, this kind of a syndicated uh, loan, we say that, okay, in order for us to get the loan paid back according to what they say they will do, that is to use school fees from their students to pay it for as long as it will take. We are going to incorporate SPV, special purpose vehicle. We're going to incorporate a company which will have just one purpose. And that purpose is just to collect the fees, and that is all. Collect the fees and share it among the three uh, companies which raised the, the, the 50 million cities loan. So such an SPV, such a special purpose vehicle, you notice that virtually it will not have any risk and so on. So if you, you have unlimited uh, liability, uh, it's not that risky as it were. Then we also have an external uh, company, an external uh, company. So if you talk about the external company, we have to go to session 329. Uh, a external company, we go and look at the provision very soon. Uh, is a, a if you just uh, is a company which was uh, registered or operated uh, outside uh, Ghana, not in Ghana. So if we take session three two nine, session three two nine, uh, I'm copying my hard copy. We'll be told that uh, session three three zero to session three four two apply to external company as defined in this session. And how is it defined? Uh, session 329, uh, subsection two, defines external companies as follows, and I quote, uh, an external company is a body corporate formed outside the republic, which has an established place of business in the country. So if the particular company was incorporated or registered outside Ghana, and it has a place of business, a established place of business in Ghana, that is an external uh, company. So let us uh, keep that in mind. So if you look at the subsection three, let me see if we can just try to now. I want to show you the provision. That's it.
good. Yeah, so let's have it here. So section 329, uh, subsection 2 defines a senior company, as I said, as an external company is a body corporate formed outside the Republic, which has an established place of business in the country. So the litmus test is that it was incorporated or formed outside the Republic of Ghana. And two, it has an established place of business in Ghana. And when we say established place of business, it's a term of arts. So it has a particular meaning. So if you look at subsection three of section 329, we are given what an established place of business means. And I quote, it means a branch, management, share, transfer, or registration office, factory, mine, or any other fixed place of business. So if the company was registered outside Ghana, has any of these things we are, you know, we are leading to or a similar aspect, it is considered as having established place of work or business in Ghana, but does not include an agency. Like if you have maybe an appointed uh, uh, you know, agency that is not considered as having established place of business. But of course, if you have an agent, someone you are put in Ghana to habitually exercise general authority to uh, negotiate and conclude contracts on behalf of the body corporate which was you know, incorporated outside Ghana, then that can be considered as having a service place of business in Ghana. Okay, so it's four minutes to 10. Uh, we go to work tomorrow. So we will leave here, we, we stop here. Uh, tomorrow we continue with company law uh, so that uh, uh, Wednesday we do the jurisprudence since we have a lot of things to cover in, in, in this particular area. So have a good night. Thank you, sir. Have a good night too.